Um, this style of eating has really been around for you know hundreds of years, and um, you know our founder, she actually grew up in England, and um, you know over in over in Europe and England, you know grazing style food and and, and charcuterie and all of that uh, has been very popular for a long time. Mm -hmm. And you know that's that's how she grew up, you know, eating grazing style food and 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 eating off eating charcuterie boards. And you know, we like to say with charcuterie boards, there's a little bit of something for everybody on there. And that's kind of the way that we kind of design the boards. Hey there, and welcome back to the podcast. I meet a lot of really interesting people on this podcast and out in the restaurant world. And I see lots of different concepts. Well, in this episode, this concept is really unique. It's all about custom crafted and curated charcuterie boards and picnic boxes. Very convenient for guests. You know, the pandemic has shifted the way we all do business, but this concept is really poised for the future. It's got a catering angle to it. Lots of nuggets here. You're not going to want to miss this episode. And thanks to our sponsors this week, Works, The Birthday Club, and serve the restaurant training app. Now, on with the episode. You're tuned in to the Restaurant Rockstars podcast. Powerful ideas to rock your restaurant. Here's your host, Roger Bodwin. Hey, Rockstars, let's talk restaurant marketing. I started and ran five high-volume restaurants, and I was obsessed with marketing. Not the traditional kind where you try this and you try that and you hope for the best. That's like dumping $100 bills out the window, but nobody's coming in the door. I'm talking about marketing that's trackable, where you know exactly where the business is coming from. And most important, that it delivers far more than every penny you spend. So here's where my friend Dyson comes in. He's a restaurant person, just like you, owned his own concepts. Now he runs Fan Connect. He's got something called the Birthday Club that's proven to drive new and repeat business in your door because everybody has a birthday. He does it all for you, too. All the heavy lifting. All you have to do is focus on your guests and delivering true hospitality. Why not speak with Dyson yourself? He loves talking shop with operators, and there's no obligation, but I'm pretty sure he can boost your business and put more butts in your seats. If I still own restaurants, it's exactly what I'd do. Check it out at fanconnect.com slash birthday rockstar. Restaurant owners and managers, listen, this is important. If you haven't heard of the employer retention credit, your business can receive lots of money back from the IRS, money you've already paid in payroll taxes. Now, the ERC program, as it's known, is available if your operation had fewer than 500 employees, you had to shut down or partially suspend your business, or you had at least a 20% reduction in business due to COVID-19 in any quarter of 2020 and the first three quarters of 2020. Now, how much is the credit? Up to $7,000 back per employee per quarter for 2021 and up to $5,000 per employee in 2020. Listen, if you have 10 employees today and meet the requirements, you could receive up to $260,000 back in a refundable tax credit. Now, the faster you apply, the faster you get the cash. Think of it as found money that you can use for any purpose, payroll, cost of goods, business improvement, or other business expenses. Again, best of all, you do not need to pay this money back. Now, Works is a company that will do all the heavy lifting for you and get your business back the money that's due. I'm speaking from experience here with Works. I received a sizable amount back in all available quarters from my former restaurant, and I couldn't be more pleased with their service, their people, and their process. For a no-obligation consult, click the link for Works in the show notes to this episode. Don't miss out. Get your consult today. Welcome back, everyone. This is the Restaurant Rockstars podcast. We're glad to have you with us. With me today, Mr. Brady Lee. He is the president of a concept called Graze Craze. Very unique, interesting concept. I can't wait to get into that. Welcome to the show, Brady. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Well, as my guests know, I always start with the backstory of my guest in the food space, what they've done and how that led to their current position. So I understand that you've been involved in franchising with different food concepts. So tell us about uh, your experience. 
Yeah, great. So, you know, I've I've been in franchising pretty much my entire life. Um, I've been uh, with United Franchise Group for about 10 years now. Um, United Franchise Group, we own and operate nine different franchise companies, three of them uh, being in the food industry and Grace Craze being our, uh, our newest addition to our food division. But, um, you know, the beginning part of my career was actually focused more on the marketing side. Um, so I would work with some of our brands really early on out of our franchise development department and kind of help get them off the ground, help from a, uh, a website perspective, marketing plans, uh, presentations and things like that. Uh, did that for a while. And then I actually uh, ran that department for a couple of years um, where I oversaw our marketing budget and I, I worked with our team, um, not really working with any one brand in particular, um, but just overseeing our franchise development department from that end. Uh, from there, I actually moved over to Australia, where I worked out of our corporate office in Sydney, nice. and I was our director of franchise sales over there. So not really working with any one brand in particular again, but um, just overseeing the growth effort nationally for Australia. And uh, for us at UFG here, Australia is actually our second biggest market. Um, outside of obviously the U.S., so um, spent some time over down under and uh, nice. came back to the U.S. And then I actually took over as the president of Accurate Franchising. And for us, Accurate Franchising is the consulting arm of the company where we work with businesses who actually want to become a franchisor and go through the process of franchising their business. Um, you know, and and with Accurate Franchising we see kind of the full gamut of everything. It's not, um, it's not any, we're not focused on any one industry in particular, but food is obviously, you know, one of the, one of the hotter industries in franchising. So we dealt with a lot of food concepts and with that brand, like I said before, it's more of a, it's, it's more consulting. So um, we go in and we work with uh, people who are just kind of getting off the ground um, sometimes they just have one location and, um, you know, they're, they're really just getting started. Sometimes they have multiple locations and um, they're, they kind of just need help from a uh, paperwork standpoint we, and we're ready to go. So um, I ran that brand for a while and then I took over as our chief operating officer here at United Franchise Group in uh, May of 2020. So uh, smack dab in the middle of pandemic, great time to uh, hop into a, a, right. a new role from that <laughs> end. But, um, yeah. you know, I, I uh, oversee a few different departments, but, you know, my team from a UFG standpoint is what we call shared services. Um, so we're uh, different departments and groups of people that will actually work with all of our brands that we have here at UFG. And, um oversee everything from the IT to the whole launch process. Um, so finding locations, negotiating leases, working through um, the build outs of the locations, training and, and, and all of that. So um, we're a very unique company here at UFG because we have nine different brands in a lot of different industries, but um, our food division is our newest uh, newest, you know, kind of division that we've built up over the last few years here at UFG and Grace Craze is our newest one. And we're really excited about it. You know, I really want to get into the ins and outs of franchising. That's going to come a little bit later in this, um, in this session, but let's talk a little bit about, well, it's an interesting concept and it's an interesting name. We all know what grazing is, of course, you know, you kind of sure. wander around, you don't really have any sit down meals. You go in the refrigerator, you see something interesting. You take a bite of this, a bite of that. A couple hours later, you might do the same thing that to us I, or to me is grazing, but let's talk about what is the graze style food category per se? And what does graze craze offer? Let's tell us about the concept. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, grazing uh, as a, as a, as a term yeah. um, is a little bit newer, you know, it, it, over the last few years, it's really picked up popularity, but um, this style of eating has really been around for, you know, hundreds of years. And, um, you know, our founder, Carrie Sylvester, she founded the business back in 2018. She actually grew up in England and, um, you know, over in, over in Europe and England, you know, grazing style food and, and, and charcuterie and all of that, uh, has been very popular for a long time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's, that's how she grew up, you know, eating grazing style food and, and, and eating off eating charcuterie boards. And, um, you know, she, she started the concept, like I mentioned in 2018 and, when we met Carrie, um, 
you know, back in, I think it was end of 2020, early 2021. Um, it was really interesting to us because it was almost like a new um, food category within food. You know, it kind of seems like everything's been thought of already in, in the food industry. Um, but, you know, we came across the Gray's Craze and, and we met Carrie. We just love the business. You know, it's a it's a niche business. It for is sure. For sure. Yep. Um, but it also has a wide range of potential customers. And, and, and uh, you know, we like to say with charcuterie boards, there's a little bit of something for everybody on there. And that's kind of the way that we kind of design the boards to you obviously have your meats, you have your cheeses, but we have. Uh, vegetables, we have fruit, we have hummuses, we have dips, we have mm -hmm. chocolate. So, you know, we want to have a little bit of something for everybody. And, um, you know, that's kind of uh, our, our goal from that. And it's to make sure that we're not, even though we are a niche concept, is to make sure we're not catering just one particular type of customer. It's to have a, a wide appeal. So Carrie is an Air Force veteran. Did she get out of the service and then just come up with this idea, the brainchild for Gray's Craze? based on what you said growing up in England and that being a really popular style of eating. And then all of a sudden she's like, oh, I'm going to start a restaurant and it's going to be based on, you know, picnic boxes and charcuterie boards and all that sort of thing. Did she have one single location and how did it lead to your group? And you just discovered it and said, oh, this has mass appeal. It could be a huge franchise. I mean, tell us about how the, those two pieces came together. Yeah. So Carrie actually, um, started a test kitchen in 2018. Okay. She had, you know, kind yeah. of dabbled in charcuterie, like a lot of people mm -hmm. have from home and done it at parties and all that. And, you know, she really started to get a little bit of notoriety in Oklahoma city where, where they, uh, where they founded the business. And, um, she started a test kitchen, trying out different boards, trying out different ingredients seeing what fits well, um, with certain pairings and, and all of that. And, um, she opened up her first location in 2020 uh, in the, right before the pandemic started. So wow. right when we were kind of on that uh -huh. line of when oh, wow. everybody just was before, really because yeah, I mean, the pandemic started in like March of 2020, right. And then everything Correct. went crazy from there. So literally just before, here we go. Oh, that must've been a crazy time for her. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, what, what's interesting is that, um, she actually opened up three locations that year. Um, so, you know, that first one opened up right before the pandemic started, but the mm -hmm. next two were, um, right in the middle of the pandemic, you know, when people were still at home and people were working from home and everybody right. wasn't sure what yeah. kind of was going to happen next in the world. Um, you know, this business did really well, um, because it's all a takeout and delivery. There's no, there's no dine in, there's no sit down. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's a, it's a business that really, did well during the pandemic just because of the way that it's it structured. Yeah. Where were the original locations? There's three. The first three that, that she opened up was in Oklahoma City. Okay. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, yeah. I'm originally from Massachusetts. I was on the website looking at the different locations. And obviously, I see there's Florida and, and it is starting to spread around the country. But you've got an Amherst location, which is yeah. a big college town, really close to where I grew up. I found that kind of interesting. So Oklahoma City. So then what happened next? OK, she's got these three stores. They did well during the pandemic. And, you know, um, were they they were all in the Oklahoma City area, like within a certain radius of so she could kind of monitor each store and, and be in each location and that kind of thing, because that's obviously important when you're not necessarily, um, you know, really well versed in the ins and outs of running restaurants, per se. But what happened yeah, next? Yeah, all, all three of them were in uh, different suburbs of, of Oklahoma mm -hmm. City. So, you know, this this business is it's not a it's not a full service restaurant. So, right. um, you know, you really only need three, maybe four employees on at a time to run mm -hmm. the business. Um, so it does lend itself to yes. um, having multiple locations, but also being able to manage multiple units at the same time. Um, so, yeah, Carrie had managers in each store and then, you know, yeah. eventually hired a district manager. Um, who kind of oversees the other managers as well. But yep. it's funny you mentioned uh, Amherst. That store is actually opening up next week. Oh, it's um, a new it's a new one that's opening. It's then. a brand new one. It hasn't even oh, opened up yet. So great. Um, you know, hopefully you can uh, you can support the local business and maybe get a couple boards. Well, you know, it's it's so interesting because that is a small town in Massachusetts that has the yep. University of Massachusetts down the street that has like 30 or 40,000 students. And this 
whole concept, I think, lends itself well to that town. I think it was well selected. So your group was part of the selection process or you, you decide on locations or how did that work? Yeah, so all of Carrie's stores that she has are considered corporate locations, mm -hmm. um, but you know we're the franchisor. So we met Carrie, like I said, end of 2020, early 2021, and um, she was actually introduced to us through a Transworld business advisor, um, which is one of our other franchise brands that we actually own and operate as well. So he was a local guy in, in Oklahoma and he made the connection from that end. And, you know, for us at the time, we were looking to add um, another brand to the food division. And, uh, you know, we're looking for something with smaller footprint, didn't require a lot of employees to, to, to run the business and um, was also a, um, a little bit lower on the investment side because we of have course. two other brands and um, we wanted something to, that was different, something to diversify and Grace Grace kind of ticked all of those boxes. But um, we took on the franchise company where the we're, we're running the franchise company and Carrie is running her corporate unit. So all of the units that are underneath the, I call it the UFG umbrella yes. are all franchise locations. So we'll mm -hmm. work with the owners um, you know, locally in their area to help find them a location that were, uh, that works best, uh, for them and for us. Now, franchising in the restaurant space can be really complicated. If you're starting from scratch, it takes endless amount of time and endless legal fees and hours and all that sort of thing and, and putting manuals together and training systems. But that's what your company obviously specializes in. So whether it's food or whether it's another industry, is there sort of a common roadmap template to starting a franchise like this? And you, you mentioned you have other food concepts as well, but obviously it must cut the time and the legalities and everything when when you recognize something that you know in your heart or in your gut just is going to turn, you know, take the world by storm or even the country. Is that kind of how it goes? I mean, I'm really curious and my audience probably is as well, because there's a lot of independent operators out there that think they've got a really special concept and they know that it can grow far beyond what they're able to achieve on their own. But again, sure. franchising can be a really daunting process, especially if you're trying to run a restaurant and trying to start a franchise at the same time. So do you want to walk us through what a typical process would be like and the steps and the time and all that sort of thing is, can you do that for us? Yeah. I mean, there, there, there's a, there's a lot that goes into it. Uh, there's a lot to go into franchising and, you know, I, as I was the president of, of accurate franchising, when I was working with business owners who wanted to franchise, I would ask them sometimes why they're looking to franchise. Okay. And um, yeah. sometimes people uh, would say, you know what, I've, I've been running my business for 10 years. I just don't want to work as hard. So I want to uh, franchise my business. And I'll tell them, if you're not looking to work as hard, you probably shouldn't look to franchise because it, it, it's a lot of work, you know, and, and, it, and it takes time to develop systems and develop processes. Um, but for us at United Franchise Group, yes, if there's a template, there's not really a template to franchising a business. Um, but for us, we've almost kind of created our own template at UFG. Um, so Grace Craze is our ninth brand. We started with Sinorama back in 1986 with our, with our first brand. Mm -hmm. um, and over the last 35, 36 years, we've built up systems and processes in place to be able to um, pop a brand in real easily. Um, so we already have the infrastructure. We already have, like you mentioned, legal. We have a legal department. We have an accounting department. We have a technology department. Uh, we have a training center. So for us, we're able to add brands quickly and be able to expand um, quicker than, um, you know, if somebody were to try to go in it alone. Um, and, you know, for us, we, we like to say, you know, the, the partnership between us and Carrie and her team, it's kind of a perfect marriage because we're an expert in franchising and she's an expert in charcuterie. Um, so we work together on, on, we've worked together for, for the last year and a half or so of making sure that we have, um, built it the right way and making sure that we have the infrastructure to have a quick launch. Um, but, you know, I, I'm a little bit biased. I said, I've been in franchising my whole life. Um, but, you know, franchising to me is the best way to grow and the best way to scale your business. So, um, you have to do it the right way, um, but it's much easier to franchise and, and to grow quickly than it is to just kind of do it on your own and have a whole lot of corporate units all across the country. For sure. And consistency and standard practices and procedures and the menus, all that has to be pretty much standard across the unit, right? 
Is there any um, opportunity for a new franchisee to have sort of their own direction in this? I mean, obviously you take the framework and you've got a proven menu and the names are interesting and all that, but is there any opportunity for someone to come up with a bright idea and say, Hey, can we do this? Or how strict is your franchise in terms of keeping to the original concept? Yeah. I mean, for us, it's, it, we, we want entrepreneurs and this business itself is, is a creative type business. So it definitely mm-hmm. lends itself to people trying new things and trying out new ideas. And we're very collaborative with our franchisees. So um, we want our franchisees to, to come up with new ideas and bring them to us. You know, we've said that for the last 35 years, years we get most of our best ideas from our franchisees. Oh, because do. they're the ones that are awesome. in the field doing it and yeah. and um, trying out new things and, and and trying out new ways to help grow the brand. And what we do is take some of those ideas and facilitate them to the rest of the system, to the rest of the franchisees. And you know, sometimes um, you know, sometimes that it, we may have an idea that a franchisee brings to us, and we say that's a great idea. Go try it. Go test it out and and see how it goes. Sometimes we you know we may get an idea from a franchisee and maybe tweak it a little bit and say, that's a good thought, but maybe have you mm-hmm. thought of doing it this way and it works well. Um, or if a, a franchisee came to us and said, Hey, I want to start selling pizza or ice cream out of our location. <laughs> yeah, they say, I don't know about yeah. that. You know, that's yeah, a little exactly. bit far. That's a stretch. Um, but yeah, exactly. But you know, for us, it's a balance to making sure that we're maintaining brand integrity and not straying too far, but also making sure that we're continuing to evolve the business and continue to grow it. Um, because for us, Right now, we're the we're it, it, it's it's uh, great to say we're the largest charcuterie franchise in the world because we're pretty much the only one. Um, so you know, for, from our standpoint, um, you know, we, we know that we're kind of the first in this category, but we know there's going to be people that pop up that you know will be copycat or we try to try to try to um, take something similar to what we've done. So we don't want to just sit back and rest on our laurels. We want to continue to grow the brand and make sure that we're always at the 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 the, the cutting edge and the next step of making sure that we're, um, you know, the best that we can possibly be. Now, when we say charcuterie, most people are thinking meats and cheeses, but it goes so far beyond that. Can you describe or define what that word really means and how that relates to your concept and what your actual offerings are? Yeah, yeah, sure. So for us, we really have, um, we have four main boards. We have the the Gone Grazy, which is the the kind of the the standard classic board that has a little bit of everything. Like I mentioned before, it's got meats, it's got cheeses, it's got vegetables, it's got fruit, it's got dips, it's got chocolate. Um, but then we also have a keto board as well uh, for people that are mm-hmm. uh, you know using the keto diet or just looking to to drop yes. a few pounds. Yes, um, we have a, a vegetarian board. That's uh-huh. a the the veggie grazy, and it's this straight um, for 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 vegetarians. And then we also have the sweet and grazy, which is our uh, dessert board. Um, so, you know, a lot of people will, sometimes they'll, they'll get two boards, they'll get the larger, the gone grazy, the big board, and they'll get a smaller, maybe, um, sweet and grazy for a little bit of dessert. So Love the names um, too. we want to keep the menu simple. Like I said, we just have the four main boards. We don't mm-hmm. want, um, to go to steer too far off of that, but, you know, we're always evaluating the boards and making sure that, um, you know, the franchisees one can be as profitable as possible, but also, uh, making sure that we're, we're also, we're also maintaining the the presentation because that's really, really important for us um, because it's a, it's, it's, it's a type of food and a type of business that people want to take pictures of. Um, so we want people to take a picture of it, post it on Instagram and tag us and um, try to gain an organic following kind of that way. So, um, you know, like I said, we want to keep the menu simple, but we also want to make sure that there's a little bit of something for everybody. Now, the boards are obviously ideal for serving, you know, so several people, but you're also doing picnic boxes that could be, you know, romantic date on the beach or whatever it is, right? So is yeah. the menu perhaps based off the charcuterie boards itself when you go to a picnic box or is that entirely separate? No, it's all, it's all the same ingredients that are okay. on the board. Yeah. Um, so that, that doesn't change. So we have, um, we have boards, we have usually we have four different sizes of boards, um, but it all is the same ingredients. It's just kind of scales down, obviously, mm-hmm. the smaller that the board uh, is from the from the larger one. 
Gotcha. Now, all of these, I love the word curated because it, it definitely lends itself to crafting, to specialization. And these are all handcrafted. You're using the finest ingredients, of course, and you call them in-house graziologists, right? So people are actually yeah. trained in this sort of technique when they become a franchisee of the company. They come in, you mentioned you've got sort of a training center, right? And they're sure. learning how to put all this together as well as business practices. Tell us about the process of, you know, I'm a new franchisee and I'm now coming in for training. What am I going to learn and how soon before I'm actually operating a unit? Sure. Yeah. So our corporate headquarters is in West Palm Beach, Florida. That's where I'm based. That's where that's where we have everything down here. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, from a training perspective, we do two weeks of training for the franchisee or for a manager. And that's really, and that's done out of the corporate headquarters here. Um, it's done on site. We actually have a training school going on right now. Uh, and um, it's really more about how to run a graze craze. They're not coming to West Palm Beach to slice meat or cut carrots or anything like that. Um, it's really more business ownership, how to run, how to manage, what are all of our processes that we have. Okay. Um, then we'll do two weeks of additional training at the actual location. Um, so that is really when we're diving into how to make all the boards and put all the boards together. You know, it's more, uh, our, our grazeologists that we, uh, that, that we call them, they're more of a, it's almost like they're putting together a puzzle more so than they're actually putting together a recipe and, and, and cooking. So, um, you know, like I mentioned before, the presentation is very important. So it's a it lot is. of repetition. It's a lot of making sure that they um, have all of the, the right ingredients, the right amount of ingredients and making sure that the boards look good. Um, and, you know, that that's really that third week of training is when we're diving into all of that back of house. And then we have a fourth week of training at their location as well, but that's all marketing. It's all going out to different businesses, showing them how we get corporate accounts and how we have um, commercial accounts. And, you know, we really like that because that's repeat business, you know, that that's um, going to be larger businesses that are, that are going to consistently order from the, from the stores and that they can kind of count on on a regular basis. So it's a four week training program. Um, and, you know, once, once we're, once we're done with that, they're off to the races. Yeah, I thought the commercial accounts was particularly smart for repeat business. Like you said, it's great. I mean, obviously, smaller businesses can do lunches and they can um, obviously take on that. And you've got the individual people with the picnic boxes. But obviously, the commercial accounts would be awesome. Big hospitals, big businesses, all of that. And once they're familiar with the concept, when obviously their their employees love it, then they're more apt to obviously continue to contact you. This is all order in advance. Is it online ordering? What's the time if I on um, spur of the moment, it's like, oh, I feel like a charcuterie board. How soon before yeah. I can actually get it if I'm in your neighborhood or <laughs> down the street? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it is ordered in advance um, mm -hmm. because, you know, charcuterie boards, for the most part, it's not a, 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 there's not a whole lot of impulse buying. Most people aren't just driving by and saying, hey, I feel like having a charcuterie board right now. Um, but, you know, so for the larger events, for like if there's a wedding, if there's um, a networking event or, mm -hmm. uh, or or whatnot, those are usually done in advance. And we have an online ordering system that people can order online um, or they can call in and, and uh, we can do the order for them. But um, we do have uh, particularly the smaller boxes. So particularly like the lone grazer or the picnic boxes where, oh, um, you know, people... Um, you just want something for lunch, something quick, something that um, is not heavy that they can kind of pick at, um, you know, that we do see a little bit of a, of a lunch rush um, for, for some of the stores that, um, you know, are nearby other businesses that have maybe let's like a, like a bartenders or waiters or people who work at a gym, um, something where they don't really just sit down and eat a full meal. They kind of pick at it, they take a bite and they go, you know, take the next order or whatever. So, um, you know, there, there, is, there is quite a bit of that, but the, for the most part, a lot of the, the larger orders are done in advance. How much um, time in advance would you say is typical? And these are obviously cold storage products where, you know, they're prepared, they're wrapped, prepared to package to go, and then they're sitting waiting for people to pick them up. Um, you know, somebody calls in advance or somebody orders it. How long is uh, a board, you know, prepared before it's actually picked up? Yeah, I mean, it depends on the event, you know, we're, 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 preparing it same day. So it's not mm -hmm. like we're preparing it a couple of days in advance and it's just sitting in a, in a refrigerator or anything like that. Okay. Um, but, 
it, it's all fresh. It's all freshly, uh, all, everything's fresh cut, everything's fresh sliced. So um, we don't want to have it sitting around for a while, even though it's, I mean, it's, it's cured in meats and cheeses and it's vegetables. It, it stays, if you keep it in the fridge, it stays good for a while, yes. uh, but we want our customers to have the best experience. So um, we make sure we do it same day and, and uh, that's when the orders go out. So it is an interesting concept and it is an alternative to traditional catering that no one would necessarily think of until, you know, awareness is built. What's your marketing plan and say a new franchisee has a a store opening coming up. Describe the whole marketing plan and strategy for the launch and how do we get awareness within the community, not only with individual people, but commercial accounts. Obviously, you've got all that worked out, too. Yeah. Yeah. Now we have a, uh, we have a, a really good marketing plan to where we actually do a little bit of pre-marketing before the stores even open. Mm-hmm. Um, so we want to make sure that we're starting to get the name out there. Uh, a lot of it's done uh, through social media. We have a um, Tilson who's, who's uh, on the call here. They do some um, PR articles to let people, to let the, the local, um, the, 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 the local neighborhood know that the store is opening and it's coming up. And then once it opens, we still do some couple more PR articles after that. But um, we have a couple of really great marketing partners that it's, it's a blend. It's a blend of online marketing and it's through social media and through pay-per-click and things like that. Um, we have the PR firm and then we have another company, uh, Field Day, that we use that does uh, I guess more traditional uh, boots on the ground marketing where they're just mm-hmm. going to businesses and they're trying to um, spread brand awareness and, and get some catering orders uh, from that end as well. So it's more of a three tiered marketing plan that we have. And um, you know, it, 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 our goal is to get the name out there and get franchisees successful right off the bat. Your packaging is also eco-friendly. Let's talk about that. No, it can actually, some of it can actually be repurposed, right? In the future for other people, you know, holding foods or for leftovers or for whatever, but it's sort of, um, it's like gift wrapped. It looks like uh, something really special when you pick it up, right? Yeah. Yeah. Most of our packaging is, is it, it, it's balsa wood. So it's, um, it's eco-friendly. Mm-hmm. It can be repurposed. Like you said, um, you know, for the larger boards that, you know, can feed 10 to 12 people, they're more of a, of a solid board um, because it's, it's almost, it's, you know, it's 18 it to pounds to of food. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yes. So you can't really have anything flimsy on there. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, but, you know, people re reuse the boards, you know, for, for their own purposes and whether it's a serving tray or whatever, it's a, it's like I said, it's more of a solid board. Um, but you know, it was important to us to make sure we had eco-friendly packaging and, um, especially with the kind of food that we have, it's healthier food and it's, um, you know, it, it's better for you. So we also wanted to kind of package that with something that was also healthier for the earth. Can you speak to profit margins of these particular boards and what the food cost is in relation to the profit and terms of, uh, we know that the labor cost is relatively low because it doesn't require a tremendous amount of staffing to um, operate a unit. So obviously food and labor costs are the two biggest expenses in any restaurant concept. So obviously you've got that dialed so that, you know, the financial controls are in place, the portion controls, the standardized procedures and all that, but how profitable is it to sell a board versus uh, a picnic box to go or versus whatever? Well, I have to be a little bit careful with um, the, the the way that we kind of talk about profit margins, because from a franchising standpoint, there are kind of rules and regulations of what we can and can't say. I see. Um, but we have our if anybody's interested in, in um, learning a little bit deeper about the profits, we have what's called a franchise disclosure document. Yes. Um, that has some has the numbers, has the, the gross sales, the, the, um, the gross profit and net profits of the first three stores in mm-hmm. that, in that document. Um, but based off of the franchise disclosure document, those three stores, um, they were all profitable within their first year. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a business to where it's not a, it's not a restaurant, right? So a lot of people are used to the, yes. the restaurants, mm-hmm. um, where it's huge volumes, but lower profit margins, where there's a lot of food wastage is really high labor. Um, you know, we don't have any, really any food wastage or food spoilage at all, because it's mostly meats and cheeses. And, um, the only kind of, the only kind of food spoilage you're going to have is because you're, you're constantly eating it and constantly, um, sampling your own product. So that, that, that'll, um, be where some of that product will go. But, um, if anybody, anybody wants to talk, look a little bit deeper into the numbers and, and, and dive into that, we have our franchise disclosure document, which they can look at. 
Fair enough. It also seems like inventory control is not much of a problem because obviously all the different ingredients are cross-utilized amongst the different products. And although each board looks very, very elaborate, your storage needs aren't tremendous. The square footage of the stores doesn't need because it's obviously not a sit-down concept. What is an average square footage of a store? Yeah, we're looking at about a thousand square feet. Okay. Um, yeah. So, you know, like I mentioned earlier, there's yeah. no there's no dine in, there's no sit down. You don't need a, you, you need a smaller lobby area and there's no hoods. There's no grills. Most, most locations don't need grease traps. So yeah. um, there's not a lot to the back. It's, it, and it's a, uh, it, like I said, there's not a lot of cooking. Um, it's not so equipment it's really, intensive you're, is what I'm hearing. It's not, you know, it's not our, yeah. our you know, everything um, all in it's under 200,000 to get a location open, which is, you know, from a, from a restaurant perspective, oh, yeah, you're never going to find that anywhere. Yes, um, yes. But for, for us, what we're able to do is we don't need a lot of inventory, like you mentioned before, because mm -hmm. um, we have a good relationship with the uh, great partners with vendors that we can get fresh produce daily if needed. Um, and then the rest is just, it's, it's meats and cheeses and um, it's, it's dips and all of that. So, you know, it, the, don't need a lot of inventory. I mean, you start off with about five to seven thousand dollars worth of inventory, and you kind of obviously scale up from there as your as your uh, business grows. But uh, yeah, it's a it's a it's a really unique uh, concept within the food industry, and because it's not a restaurant, it's just uh, uh, it, it's in the food industry, but it's not you it's know like a commissary a kitchen on a like small that. scale, right? Would you so, describe yeah, it as such? Yeah, kind of similar. Yeah, I mean, it mm -hmm. it it is similar to that. You know, we don't do much cooking, as I mentioned before, it's bacon, you bake the bread fresh and um, you, 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 um, you know, cook some of the ham a little bit in a, uh, in a, in an oven, but that's it, you know, so it's, it's not even really to even call it a kitchen is a bit of a stretch in the back end because there's not a lot of cooking, but um, there is obviously assembly of the boards. Guys, I've always believed in systems to run a really effective restaurant. They say you have a system if you can walk away and leave your place for a day, a week, or a month. And it's just as successful, just as profitable when you return, if not more so. Now, the staff are really the foundation of this, and it all comes down to the word empowerment. You know, if you've got really great people and if you can develop those people to have your back, and to run it as if they owned it, treat everything as if they had to pay for it, that's a super powerful system. Once you have the staff in place, it really comes down to three things. It comes down to one, staff training, development, recognition, and rewards to create what I call your dream team. How to empower your team to think and act like owners and to treat everything as if they owned it and had to pay for it. And to deliver amazing guest service experiences to your customers. To serve and sell because sales are the lifeblood of your business. Not allowing order takers on the floor, but teaching everyone to recognize opportunities and make suggestions that we know the customers will enjoy and appreciate. It all comes down down to training, training, training. Number two, cost controls and maximizing profit. You need to know your critical financial numbers on a weekly basis, and it only takes 10 minutes, but you need to understand these things. How about your daily break even? How much it costs you to open the doors to your restaurant each day? Inventory is not just walking around and figuring out what your order is that week. It's knowing the true value of your goods on hand at any given point in time. And you need this information to be able to calculate your true food and beverage costs. Your labor costs are also important and running a weekly labor analysis against sales. If you know these things, I can teach you how to maximize your profit and control your costs. And then number three is what I call marketing firepower and affinity. You know, affinity is defined as a really powerful sense of loyalty and belonging where your customers become raving fans and they're like an army of brand ambassadors spreading the word for your restaurant. Well, all of this is included in the Restaurant Rockstars Academy. If you really want to take your restaurant to the next level, post-pandemic, things are heating up, customers are coming back, Now's the time to really maximize your opportunities, maximize your sales and profits, and create that dream team staff. Check it out at restaurantrockstars.com. It's the Restaurant Rockstars Academy. Let's talk about the vibe of the locations. Is that all standardized as well? 
or you've got a standard logo and the standard sign and there are colors to use, but can a franchisee sort of funk up the inside to make it their own versus it all looks like if I, if I was in Oklahoma city and I went to a Gray's craze and then I went to one in Florida and then I went to Massachusetts, do they all look relatively the same or is there some creativity allowed? Yeah, they, they, they have the, for the most part, you, when you walk into a Gray's craze, you're going to know you're in a Gray's craze. It has the same signage, um, you know, the, a lot of the same color schemes and all of that. We do give the franchisees a little bit of leeway to, if they want to spruce up their lobby a little bit. I know we have a, a franchisee that's putting a, a TV in the lobby that, you know, if people are, are kind of sitting and waiting for a board, mm-hmm. which they shouldn't be waiting a whole, very long, but, right. um, you know, they can, they can, either have the TV on or it can looping some of the products that they have. So we give a little bit of a, a little bit of leeway, but for the most part, if you walk into a Grace craze in Massachusetts and you walk into one in Dallas, you're going to know you're in a Grace craze. Has the labor crisis been a challenge for this company? N- not really, to be honest with you, you know, it, it, it's um, uh, this business, you need three or four employees on at a time. Um, so it's not like a lot of restaurants where you need, 20, 25 employees to even be operational. Yes, um, for us, right. you know, you need three or four employees. And um, I think a lot of people who are in the food industry really gravitate towards wanting to work for a Grace Craze because of quality of life standpoint. You know, our hours are, are typically eight to six. Um, so, you know, a lot of people that have been in the restaurant industry their whole lives, they're used to, if, it, if they serve dinner, they're used to being there till midnight. Or if they're a breakfast place, they're at four o'clock in the morning preparing everything. So for us, uh, our employees enjoy really the quality of life um, because they can, they come in, they, they enjoy what they do because they don't, you don't smell like burgers or, um, or pizza or anything like that. They enjoy what they do. And then they can go home and have dinner with their families. And um, so for us, we get a lot of people that are just used to grinding in the food industry for 20 years that say, wow, this is still in food and I can still use my skills and my background, but I don't have the, the grind that a lot of uh, typical restaurants would have. Now, I think I read on your website that you're proud to state that the individual stores are locally sourcing their ingredients. Is that true? Um, some of the ingredients. So uh, the the, pro, the produce is is locally sourced. You know, mm-hmm. we have obviously the meats and the cheeses and and all of that is 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 done through our distributors. But but the locally sourced um, there is a some locally sourced products that's available for the franchisees. Okay, I didn't want to get the wrong impression. Where I was going with this was obviously most franchise companies on a larger scale use the same distributor for economies of scale and volume of purchase and all that kind of stuff to get the best pricing and all that. So that still does happen then. Sure. Yeah. Okay, great. Now you have a location specialist or you help a franchisee find the best location in terms of traffic studies and walk by traffic, drive through traffic, parking, all those types of things. I mean, what's that process like? Yeah, we have a real estate department. Um, mm-hmm. that will look at demographics and, and, and look at and look at locations. The great thing about this business is you don't need to be in an A-plus shopping center. You don't need to have a Chipotle on one side and a Starbucks on the other side and have thousands of people coming by. Yes. Um, because like what we talked about earlier, a lot of the orders are done in advance. Sure. Um, you want to have good parking. We want good sign exposure for the franchisees to be able to kind of get the name out there yep. and, and get from a brand awareness standpoint. Um, but we don't want them paying huge, huge dollar, uh, uh, huge, huge huge rent and, and, and all of that. We want to keep the cost down, um, but also be in a, in a, in a good spot, but doesn't have to be in that a plus really high end location. So it's convenience of pickup, of course, visibility. So you can easily find it, but easily park. So you can pick it up without a hassle. But other than that, you don't need, like you said, a A plus location. Uh, That's another smart thing. What would you say your key competition is? Um, I, I mean, really, there isn't a lot of competition, especially from a franchising standpoint. I would say locally, um, there are there, there's a lot of people that will do charcuterie boards from home. You know, they'll they'll advertise on Instagram, they'll advertise on uh, Facebook, and you know, they'll they um, people can gain a kind of a local following from that end. But really, what differentiates us uh, differentiate differentiates us from them is the fact that we have a larger scale of being able to produce a lot the, the big orders. So a lot of the people locally, if they get really popular, they're usually booked out months in advance because you can only make so many charcuterie boards from home. 
Um, but for us, that's why we decided, you know, that's why Carrie and her team decided to go into more of the, the kitchen um, just because, you know, you can fulfill larger orders. You can do multiple orders at once. And, and that's right. how, you know, that's how we can grow. This is very, yeah. I mean, it keeps getting more and more interesting because it is niche. It is so different. It's like I said, it's, it's not really, it doesn't appear like it has much competition because it is so niche specific. That's so interesting. Let's talk a little bit about what you're looking for in a new franchise operator. You mentioned the word entrepreneurs. You're looking for entrepreneurs, yeah. obviously. Does that mean they've had prior business experience, not necessarily in food, but in another type of business or, you know, what are the key criteria you're looking for? Yeah. I mean, you know, for us, we have already, you know, we're, we're, we're new, but we already have a really wide range of people that are, that are our owners. You know, we have, sometimes you have groups that are going to be more, uh, an investor type and, you know, are going to mm -hmm. be more, I don't want to say, I don't like saying the term absentee, but not running right. the store day to day. Yeah. They're still yeah. going to be involved. They still need to know what's going on. Um, but then we also have, um, a couple of business owners that are, are into it for the, starting their own business for the, for the first time, you know, if they're, we, we, we want to have one of two things. If they don't, if they don't have owner business ownership experience, we want them to have food experience, um, and be, you know, have experience working in restaurants and in the kitchen and know how to, um, do inventory and scheduling and things like that. Um, but we're not limited to that. So, you know, we do have a lot of investors that are just looking to, um, open up multiple locations, hire managers and, and, um, kind of advise from a higher level. So, um, from our standpoint, you know, we, we, we want, like you mentioned entrepreneurs, we want people that are going to come up with ideas and be team players and want to be part of growing the brand and helping move the brand forward. We don't want people who are just going to sit in their, you know, behind in their lobby, sit at the front desk and expect everything to come to them. We want people that are going to be out in their community, growing the brand and, and getting the name out there. Fantastic. Now, what's the growth plan exactly? You currently have about 20 locations, but I believe you're, you've are you got 100 in the works. Uh, tell us about that. Yeah. So we actually, right now, as we said, we have 12 locations that are actually up and running. We wow. should have about 20 by summertime. Okay. Um, and uh, we have a lot of locations that are getting ready to open up um, kind of as, as we speak actually. And, um, our goal is to have, um, 50 by the end of the year up and running and have hundred locations by next year up and running. So with these, with these locations, there's, they, they can get open pretty quick. Um, uh, finding yet, once you find the location, a lot of these, uh, a lot of these spots are, are pretty quick build time. Um, so we can, we can get these open pretty quickly and, you know, our goal, like I mentioned before, is to have a, a hundred uh, locations open by next year. But our other goal is to be the name synonymous with charcuterie because there really is no brand name associated with charcuterie at all. Um, so charcuterie is a tough enough word to say as it is. So we'd rather have people <laughs> just say, I want a graze craze board yeah. instead of a charcuterie board. Sure. Um, and yeah. you know, that's what we do. That's what we're, we're great at growing brands and, 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 um, getting brand awareness out there. But we think once we get to that hundred point, uh, that hundred mark, that's when we say, okay, well, we, we know we, we have something here and um, we already know that we do, but you know, to the outside world, that's where you kind of say, okay, well, they have a hundred locations. This is, this is a big time company now. So. Are there any States right now or regions that you're not necessarily considering for growth is part of the plan to have sort of a regional strategy to roll it out, or literally you can shotgun it anywhere in the country. And if you've got an interesting candidate to be a franchisee and they can prove I've got a really viable location, it really doesn't matter what state. Yeah, no, we're, we're open to everywhere. Um, uh -huh. okay. you know, we already have locations that are opened up in, in Utah and Dallas, uh, you know, in, in, in Oklahoma. Um, we have, as we mentioned earlier, a location open up in Massachusetts. Right. Um, but they're opening up all over the place. We have a group that's, uh, opening up multiple locations in Las Vegas. Um, we have, um, Charlotte, North Carolina, Raleigh, North Carolina, a uh, few locations in Florida as well. So, uh, we're truly growing across the whole country. And, you know, for us at United Franchise Group, um, we have the infrastructure to be able to do that. If it was just Carrie on her own and, and she was just trying to franchise the business, I would probably tell her, you know, 
grow, go, go smaller and kind of grow regionally so you can support that. But we have support people already all over the country. Um, so we already have the infrastructure to be able to, 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 to grow quickly and to be able to, um, you know, scale much quicker than, than a lot of other companies would be able to. Well, you know, this is a really interesting, we talked about how interesting the concept is, but I really like how simplistic it is. It's not overly complicated. It seems to be pandemic proof. It's got a lot of appeal to a wide cross section of, of consumers. It's got the, you know, the corporate piece. It's got the individual piece like you. It's been well thought through. So um, it's a very interesting concept. And that is Gray's Craze. Brady, thank you so much for taking time with us and being on the podcast. Thank you for having me. Thanks to our audience again for tuning in. That was the Restaurant Rockstars podcast. We'll see everyone in the next episode. Stay tuned and stay well. Thank you, Brady, for sharing Gray's Craze with us and your unique opportunity. Thanks to our audience for tuning in. I wanted to let you know that we have launched an all-new website and an all-new Restaurant Rockstars Academy at restaurantrockstars.com. What's the academy about? Well, if you're starting your very first restaurant or if you've been in this business a while and you're just, just looking to improve up level and maximize your profits, the academy is for you. It's an all-inclusive it's a course that will take you through the logistics of starting your first concept, everything you need to know to open your doors to a restaurant. It follows up with staff training to serve and sell, teaches your entire front of house team how to recognize opportunities and sell. And don't forget, cost controls and profit maximization tools. It's all in the academy. So check it out at restaurantrockstars.com. Thanks to our sponsors again of this week's episode. Can't wait to see you next time. So stay with us. Imagine both your front and back of house teams are so well trained that they're executing flawlessly. Your front of house is doubling your sales, boosting repeat business, and creating five star dining experiences, while your back of house is consistently preparing each dish to perfection on time and to spec. Having a restaurant this dialed takes a unique training system. That's where Serve comes in. Serve means study restaurant variety. And it is a powerful, mobile training system, custom-built to meet the needs of your restaurant. Serve will up-level your team's knowledge and skills, maximize your profits, and create experiences guests will rave about. Picture this. Before the doors open for business, Susan, one of your managers, is assigning Serve training to Paul, your new bartender. Using the app, he will learn both food and beverage ingredients, allergens, romance notes, and pairings. She shows Paul how to use Serve's interactive study tools to become a master of the menu and how to use the cocktail database to easily find specs to make any drink. He can't wait to hit the floor and sees how Serve will unlock his hidden sales potential. Susan will be able to track his training progress and test his performance. I've got this. Paul says. Next, Susan just uploaded a brand new appetizer to the Serve menu using the admin dashboard. Using Serve's menu profit tools, she's determined that this new dish will have a major positive impact on the restaurant's bottom line if the team is able to sell it. So she makes it a priority sale item and gets your front of house team on board to suggest it throughout the night. Meanwhile, in the kitchen, Steve, your line cook, pulls out his phone and uses Serve to see prep notes on the new appetizer offering. Wow, he says, here are all the ingredients, the cooking steps, and a photo of the plate presentation. This makes it so easy to learn this dish. Sally, your server, returns to her table with drinks and says, may I now suggest you start with our new signature appetizer? It's the perfect complement to the chef's fantastic lobster special tonight that pairs wonderfully with a bottle of Whitehaven Sauvignon Blanc. That sounds wonderful, the guest says. We can't wait to try it. Sally learned these suggestive sales by studying pairings on Serve. Serve also allows you to up-level your management team with a comprehensive restaurant academy that includes efficiencies, inventory management, cost controls, and maximizing profit, menu engineering, proven marketing solutions, and more. Surf includes everything needed to develop your managers into rising stars in your operation. As the leader of your organization, you take pride in continuing to up-level your operation and your team. 
you know that by investing in your people, jobs become careers, and everyone in your team feels empowered to perform at their best. As you can see, the possibilities with Serve are endless. Serve is the key to unlocking your restaurant's hidden potential and will prove that the more your team is able to learn, the more your restaurant will earn. It's Serve, and it's a game changer. Ready to serve? Get started at srvnow.com. Thanks for listening to the Restaurant Rockstars podcast. For lots of great resources, head over to restaurantrockstars.com. See you next time.